Before me in the east, Nephthys. Behind me in the west, Isis. On my right hand in the south is Set, and on my left hand in the north is Horus. For above me shines the body of Nuit, and below me extends the ground of Geb, and in the centre abideth the great hidden god. When we first started looking at the topic of blood, Charlotte asked me why Seth is particularly involved in all these issues. And I have to say, it's like so much else, it's all about serendipity, luck, and arbitrary choice. Well, in this presentation, we're going to look at an example of something where a little bit of serendipity leads us into some very interesting territory. There are many ways to show how important blood is in the old-time magical religion. So let's start with the famous ubiquitous image of the Ankh. It's the most famous of all Egyptian hieroglyphs. It's also one of the very few to survive into the Christian era when it becomes the early Christian sign known as Cairo, which most scholars would say the Christian Cairo symbol actually derives directly from the Egyptian symbol for the Ankh. Now the Ankh linguistically means as we all know, life. But one thing about Egyptian hieroglyphs is that they are pictograms. They're all pictures of something. So what object does the Ankh actually represent in real life? Now, there have been lots of different theories of this. Some say it's a representation of a sandal. In fact, the magician Alistair Crowley followed that interpretation, which was the scholarly knowledge of his time. But then when we were looking at the actual meaning or what this object was, what the Ankh actually is as a physical object, we encountered yet another set of coincidences and serendipity. For it just so happens that almost exactly 100 years ago today, the exact date is, uh, is not actually recorded, Margaret Murray participated in a groundbreaking public dissection of two mummies. These mummies come to be known as the Two Brothers, and they are displayed in Manchester Museum. And these mummies have turned out to be two of the most controversial of all mummies to exist in any museum almost anywhere in the whole world. Now, the controversy about the Two Brothers revolves around whether they are brothers or lovers. Brothers, lovers, or indeed twins, this is a very hot topic in the whole academic and scholarly realm of Egyptology. I should also remind you that this whole topic of brothers and lovers takes us right to the heart of the mythology of Horus and Set. Now returning to that very early dissection, Victorian dissection, the anatomist who was employed to dissect the two brothers soon discovered that one of the brothers was in fact a eunuch. And more than that, not only was he a eunuch, but he had undergone a remarkable operation known as sub-incision. Now the anatomist also suggested from the way the genitals had been wrapped in the two brothers' mummies that somehow the wrapping of the genitals was connected with the Egyptian Ankh hieroglyph and thus gives it its core meaning. So in other words, the way the genitals of the mummies was wrapped, they were wrapped in the form of a hieroglyph known as the Ankh. Now, in 1966, the German medical historian Wolfhard Westendorf said more about this whole thing. He was studying a series of knots or bandaging spells in the London Medical Papyrus. And these spells were used to dam up bleeding from the vagina and anus to prevent miscarriage and thus preserve life. The physical artifact that is related, that represents this kind of knot spell, is known as the Knot of Isis. And one way or another, the knot of Isis is a prototype of the Ankh. Now, to give you an example of one of these spells, it's a very old spell, originally part of the Neolithic cattle cult of Hathor, and I'd say the god Set. And the first of these spells reads, Go back, companion of Horus, go back, companion of Set. Thoth repulses the blood. He has come from Hermopolis. He refuses to let the red blood come now. Do you not know the dam? Return, I say, in the name of Thoth. All this is said either over a red amulet or a bound menstrual cloth or tampon. We see Thoth, then, as the healer. 
We see Horus and Seth, the two brothers, connected with blood. We see Horus and Seth, the two brothers, connected with the menstrual cycle. And we see Horus and Seth, the two brothers, connected with the moon. And their companions are various ancestral spirits that are connected one way or another with blood. Mog thought that it would be interesting to weave our individual approaches together and do this talk in tandem, as although we use different magical tools, we have similarities in practice. The tools which we both use are a taboo subject, the study of which, in itself, acts as an initiatory device. By challenging the status quo of what defines us and that which operates around us, how can we hope to comprehend the worlds of spirits and the gods when we restrict our vision in this world? Now these tools could be seen as being demonic, in that we're working with spiritual forces which are often considered or represented to be negative or evil. Is this a deliberate choice of perhaps inflammatory subject matter, or, as Mog intimated, following an inner and very natural predilection? For myself, my obsession with blood is a very instinctive thing. Yes, there may be a conditioned goth shock quality in there, but there is also a pull that's always been present, and it feels very right to follow this path, despite the problems that may, and have, arisen along the way. Illustrated is a concept which could be seen to link our respective presentations. The ankh as an Egyptian symbol of life portrayed as a loincloth, or as a sanitary napkin. I will not deny a small and perhaps a cheap thrill in presenting such a different perspective of an iconoclast image, However, putting my vicarious thrills aside, I realize that the unk perceived in this way makes a huge amount of sense. Something which encloses the genitals, protecting them. Something which holds the menstrual blood. Holds the key to life and death and the mysteries therein. Last year I spoke on blood ritual as a taboo act at the Oxford Symposium, and this year I'm dealing with a specific menstrual blood, and looking at its social stigma, both historically and in the present, and its magical potentiality and its use in this context. Menstrual blood is as fascinating as venous blood and its contradiction of holding both creative life force and death within it. In many ways tribal societies could be seen to show their respect and awareness of this by making the menstruating woman a pariah who con contaminates all that she has contact with. However looking at the ostracization of menstruating women within contemporary monotheistic religions this seems to have become more of an indication of misogyny. The menstruating Romani woman is known as a mahrim, unclean. Islam and Orthodox Jews both hold similar religiously sanctioned opinions to the Romani, although Orthodox Jews take it further, and during Nida, the time of a woman's menstrual flow, and for seven to ten days after the finish of a period, a husband and wife may not touch, even indirectly using an intermediate object. Now, I've, I've kept the examples used to illustrate the widespread view of a menstruating woman as contaminated and unclean to a minimum, as I don't want to veer too much into territory dominated by gender politics. Male children in Papua New Guinea are considered to be contaminated by a woman's blood at birth and are not able to be cleansed of this until they are initiated into manhood. Then they go through a reenactment of their birth, but this time to an honorary male, actually a postmenopausal woman, and are thus reborn without contact with a woman's blood. This is an interesting example in that, in that it seems to ally with the Christian belief of original sin and of a woman being the cause of this sin, which only a rebirth, in the case of Christianity, a baptism, can remove. Another result of my research were findings which could indicate a male envy of menstruation. There are theories that the Amerindian sweat lodge is in a male attempt to emulate women's periods. Subincision, the splitting open of the urethra, is practiced by the Wogio men of Papua New Guinea, an emulation of the purification which women undergo during menstruation. Subincision and supercision, where the prupus is cut but no skin is removed, are practiced in Australia, South America, Fiji and Africa. One theory is that it's done to simulate the female genitals. This argument being further enhanced by the fact that men often gash the subincised or supersized penis to draw blood during rituals. Montague says, Seeing in the female that blood originated from the vulva, what is more natural than to make it come from the analogous organ in the male? 
Now, it is interesting to notice that there's actually very little reference to menstrual blood being used in tribal spiritual practices. And in religious ceremonies, such as those used in Santeria, which is an African diaspora religion, women who are menstruating do not participate in ceremonies or work with the religious mysteries. It is said that they should use that time to meditate on a divinity and allow their bodies to rest. Research has shown that lack of dream sleep produces similar effects to PMS, and that women allowed more time to sleep and to meditate lost many of the negative symptoms. So if menstruation is truly a time when the human consciousness is doing something differently, this may well be a practical explanation for some belief systems, such as Santeria, recommendation of rest and meditation during the menses, rather than hands-on spiritual work. However, it is worth bearing in mind that in Santeria, a priest may not work with an open wound of any sort, in case the spirits mistake the blood for an offering and develop a taste for it. As conception does not normally occur during menstruation, certain sects like the bowels of modern Bengal practice sexual union without issue by intercourse during menstruation. However, a child born as a result of such a union is considered to be imbued with a very strong power, usually for evil. The English of the 13th century believed a child conceived during menstruation was likely to be born with red hair and to contract leprosy. Tantric and alchemical practices, however, do consider the menstruating woman to be essential to their practice, bearing in mind that any culture or belief system that accepts sex during menstruation is accepting sex for a purpose other than procreation. The medieval alchemists of Europe considered that an essential ingredient for the philosopher's stone was to be found in the menses of a whore, and a similar idea prevailed in tantric alchemy. As with many other traditions, Hindus regard menstruation as a time of woman's impurity, However, in Tantrism, the situation is reversed, and any menstruating woman is considered to be the goddess incarnate. The Chinese also laid great belief in the restorative qualities of pills in which the menstrual discharges of young and beautiful girls were the main ingredient. However, access to these pills were restricted to only the royals and the very, very powerful and wealthy. What springs to mind from what Charlotte's just said is how as someone who wants to reconstruct the ancient Egyptian magical religion in a more authentic form rather than in the form you might find it in the Hollywood movies, that the context, the materials he talks about from voodoo and other living traditions today are actually, I think, give you a more accurate picture of what ancient Egyptian magic was actually like. And some of the artifacts that we're talking about like the ankh and the, the bandaging, and almost like things that are left out of the account of uh, Egyptian magic that, that actually give you a better picture of what it was really like. Okay, now I wanted to talk a little bit about the world's oldest myth, and that myth is the myth of the destruction of humanity. You can find examples of this in, a, in the book of the Heavenly Cow, which is edited by Hornum. And this account, which you might find in other mythologies as well, tells us about a time back in distant history of humanity when there was a rebellion against the aged sun god. I'm not sure what the reason for the rebellion is, but perhaps it's something about human nature that human nature does rebel. And gods, especially aged sun gods, tend to get quite angry about this. And as a punishment, the god Ra sends out one of his eyes, the fiery eye, uh, which is personified as the goddess Hathor. And he sends her out with a task to cull what he calls the divine cattle. And the divine cattle is just another name for the human being. So the god Ra sends out his emissary Hathor to kill off humanity, or at least to cull them, to teach them a lesson by killing a certain percentage of them. There's another version of this myth that comes from the Middle Kingdom times, in which instead of Hathor, it's another called the Lion Goddess Sekhmet. The interesting thing for me is that Hathor becomes mad with bloodlust. She enjoys the killing too much. She becomes so mad with the blood that rather than just culling the divine cattle, she's, she's not going to stop killing and eating and drinking their blood until they're all gone. And Ra, even though he was very angry with humanity for their rebellion, uh, doesn't actually want to destroy the entire creation. So he's a bit worried by this whole 
process that he's set in motion has to come up with some way to stop the killing. And the way he does this is knowing that Hathor is very much fond, like all the gods in fact are very fond of blood, works out another form of blood that he can give her, a fake blood, which is to take some beer and dye it with another very ancient and uh, important ritual substance, red ochre. And if you've ever had to drink beer dyed with red ochre, you'll know it or it tastes very like blood because of the iron of the ochre. And you should know that all gods, certainly all gods in ancient Egypt, and I'd say all gods, period, all gods drink blood. But in the Egyptian example, it's almost like henceforth, from the time of the myth, which is a very, very old myth, they have a substitute. They don't actually use blood. They use something else. They use beer. is the main ritual substance, in fact, in ancient Egypt, dyed with something to make it taste like blood. It's also recorded in a moment in which people turned away from the use of blood in rituals or found something else. And interesting, the thing that they find is that Hathor, not only does he like blood and killings, he's also very fond of music, dance and getting drunk. Which reminds me of the line from the Book of the Law, all acts of love and pleasure are her rituals. And that line from the poem applies especially well to Hathor, I think. She really does love music, dance and drunkenness and anything to do with pleasure. And in that sense, Hathor is very like uh, another demonized god called Set. Like Set, she is also an ancient stellar deity. Hathor is to do with the stars and astrology and what controls a person's fate that comes from outside of them. And in that sense, Hathor, who does all this killing in her history, also holds the secret of a person's fate. Whenever a person is born, their name is inscribed in a special book that she keeps everybody's name and eventual fate in. And when your time comes round, she has seven demonic adversaries, known as the Hatayu, which she dispatches to go and do the killing for her. Perhaps you say it's too dangerous for her to go herself and kill people because she tends to get carried away, but she has demonic adversaries that she sends out to do the killing. In a nice euphemism, they're also known as flower cutters, and they carry special flint knives for the purpose of cutting the flowers, which is perhaps the reason why the offering of cut flowers is so common at a, a funeral. It's a very, very ancient practice and perhaps comes from this Neolithic idea that the people who cut you down are cutting you down like a flower. The other thing that strikes me about this myth of Hathor, her liking for blood, her propensity to go out and kill people, and the fact that she can be put off with a little bit of music and dance and a party, is that this is maybe the origin in the ancient world of, of the myth of the Tsar. In the Tsar cult, people, when they're possessed by the, these ancient ancestral spirits, also use a bit of dance, alcohol, food to distract them. The task of the magician is to, first of all, find this special book, to understand why your name is in there, and to remove your name from her book. Therefore, to cheat fate. And this is the other part of the topic, is this whole issue of the demonic initiation. And not just knowing what the demons know about you, but making them forget. And that process is very, very close to the idea that we have in the modern world of exorcism. Rather than just blasting the supposed possessing entity, the demon, away, one should get to know them, offer them something, and have some sort of conversation with them. And that again is the process of demonic initiation. Some years ago, I decided to embark upon a full exploration of menstruation and its spiritual and creative applications and effects. This could be seen as a very 1960s, 1970s way of reclaiming my body, and perhaps it was. Magical practice is something which encompasses every aspect of self, and knowing myself meant knowing how my body worked. As a woman in my thirties, as I was at that time, looking at my menstrual cycle seemed to be the obvious starting point. 
Also, I was somewhat dissatisfied by the related information I came across in my research, which was too often presented by men, and occasionally women, with a not unbiased agenda. I also found that whilst recognition and utilisation of the phases of the moon and their different influences is a norm in most ritual practices, working with the menstrual cycle and the blood produced is not. I will not deny that Kenneth Grant's interpretation of the 11th degree of the OTO as heterosexual sex with a menstruating woman, rather than the standard interpretation of anal sex, and his work with colours is definitive. However, knowledge of his work is not mainstream in either theory or practice within the magical community. An interesting and I feel relevant point was presented by Paul Katzeff in his book Moon Madness. It is known and recorded that acts of violence intensify on the full moon. However, what is less known is that it is documented there's also a great rise in violence, but towards the self rather than towards others, at the time of the new moon. The reason I've pointed this out is to illustrate cycles of the moon charting relationships between yourself and the world around you. This seemed to me to be a good reference point for my explorations looking at different phases of the menstrual cycle and how they affect the ability to relate both inwardly and outwardly. To gain a wider perspective, I drew up a questionnaire which was answered by women from a variety of geographical, cultural and spiritual perspectives. I also quizzed men about their experiences with menstrual blood and working with and around a partner's cycle. The questionnaires and resultant in-depth conversations help give me a wider perspective and also further fuel the obsession which I find is necessary to do such research. As this was such a broad topic, I tried to be as specific as possible, primarily dealing with the days prior to and days actual of menstruation. The three days prior to menstruation are potentially the greatest times of power for all types of magical application, particularly those con concerned with the working with others. What can mask itself as PMT in modern day terminology is actually an intense power that can be used for focus ritual. However, the need for training and guidance could be seen to be essential, and as indicated above, rest in med meditation, as due to a conditioned perception of the onset of menstruation as a time of instability a tendency towards delusion is possible, which could create difficulty with any sort of in-depth magical work. This delusion could be seen to manifest on an earthly level as a form of bodily discomfort and a twisted self-image, which contradicts the rise and sex drive, which is calling for a celebration and an expression of the profound level of energy that is available. This is an ideal time to do sexual magical workings as a surge of power can carry the woman and any working partner or partners to previously inaccessible areas of exploration. When menstruation proper starts, the woman will feel a need to consolidate energy for herself, in the first three days anyway. This is an ideal time for scrying, astral work, divination of every sort, meditation and personal rituals. However, I feel great care is needed at this time in work of a sexual nature if communing with entities or astral manifestations. At this point in the cycle, a woman becomes like a battery of sorts, where she gives out energy but will have great difficulty recharging herself. Thus, there is a greater risk of obsessive magical relations and consequent drainage on the part of the female practitioner occurring. Aside from excessively low energy levels, in my experience and that of other women I've talked to, an obsessive sexual relationship on an astral level can manifest as exhaustion, swollen and overly sensitive genitalia, hypersexuality, and an inability to have sexual relations on an earthly level and achieve satisfaction. At this point in the cycle, the ability to travel between worlds is at its peak. However, the vulnerability in this travel is greatest. I find that if this sort of work is going to be done, it's necessary to access some sort of otherworldly help pre-journey. An alternative is to have your magical partner on hand to help ground you post-traveling. This grounding is often as simple as being held and touched with love. The recognition of there being unconditional love existing on this plane can aid the ability to extract oneself from others. 
the knowledge that these earthlings such as this can also give it an even greater freedom in travel and its generation of a feeling of safety. Blood deities are difficult to deal with, whatever the source of blood, and it always needs to be borne in mind the emotional at attachment that is connected with the blood in question. As a woman gets older, for instance, her menstruation may hold with it connotations on some levels attached with, say, the aging process, or perhaps failed attempts at pregnancy, that would be detrimental if not acknowledged and dealt with before any ritual commences. If there's no awareness of these emotional attachments, the blood can act as either a magnet of sorts to related negative entities, or twist perception of that which is contacted. Michelin Linden, author of Typhonian Teratomas, believes that menstrual blood carries a greater risk of attracting beings, called larvae, that are drawn to such blood and feed off it, and then move into the host body. This open portal invites such beings to come and stay, and Michelin theorizes that perhaps this is why a great many religious and spiritual practices are put aside during menstruation. It is quite normal for women in groups to unconsciously synchronize their cycles. However, the ability to change the timing of the menstrual cycle seems to occur on another level for some women. There are instances which show that as a woman becomes more skilled in working magically, she may find herself menstruating out of cycle at the commencement of a ritual. In theory, as one's experience of magical practice increases, so does the knowledge about one's body and its potentiality. This includes the knowledge of how powerful working within the first three days of menstruation can be, which stimulates the onset of bleeding, thus making of herself the ultimate sacrifice, herself in entirety. Menstrual blood being used with intent I find to be a very personal thing as to results. I have had debates with various practitioners over this matter and have come to the decision, as previously mentioned, the blood holds with it various aspects and attachments that come from the owner. Therefore, the nature of it will be appreciated on other levels just as individually. I personally find menstrual blood to be one of the safer fluids used in offerings. There seems less chance of it being used as a bridge for an entity to cross over to this realm to cause havoc, as there is with the use of venous blood. I find it works well for drawing sigils, although I think that sexual fluids work better for the actual charging of said sigil, and it's excellent for scrying with. It is also very good to feed servitors with, although I find that alternation with other substances is best, and I have found that servitors fed in this manner have never, touch wood, caused me problems. In my personal experience, however, I've found that consistently feeding the same substance to an entity or servitor is unwise, as it can open the way to an unbalanced and obsessive relationship where control is taken from the hands of the practitioner. The more obvious signs of this loss of control being a constant pull to contact the entity in question that overrides the will and the desire of the practitioner. Baking with intent is also another one of my favorites. A variation on cakes of light, there's nothing like a smattering of menstrual blood and focused stirring to create transformational food. This type of food can be used in rituals, celebrations, and for creating a unified consciousness in any group, or for affecting change in one's life, either in general or on a deeper level. Almost needless to say, it's ideal to use when working with Hecate, Lilith, or feminine embodiments of deities, and also in its more well-known sexual alchemical applications when mixed with semen, some of which have been previously mentioned. It has many traditional uses which are found to be very effective, such as love charms and the feeding of magical plants, such as mandrake, and it's also been cited as the main ingredient in medieval potions to cause mania, idiocy, and catalepsy. Almost needless to say, using blood of any sort holds with it, especially since the rise of blood-borne illnesses, a great measure of personal responsibility and respect in its use. However, this responsibility in theory should be a given with any sort of magical practice. The study of blood in this context has been an initiation, not just in terms of knowledge and understanding of myself and the relationship with that which operates around me on every plane, but in creating a depth within my practice and a connectivity which I believe could not have been achieved otherwise. Exploring and knowing the essence of that which can be considered demonic gives one a power over it, and removes the need for exorcism, 
and replaces it, as with the Zaya rituals, with a symbiotic and what can be a very beneficial magical relationship. Egyptian theology teaches that deities are highly ambiguous, androgynous entities with what we would call strong demonic qualities. The god Set leads them just as he leads the stars in their diurnal motion. So who is this god Set? An ancient cosmic deity with origins lost in the Neolithic. That's to say it was already an old cult at the time of the unification of Egypt in 3100 BCE. We're talking about a very old time when nations and countries didn't really exist. There was one culture, if you like, throughout the whole of the Neolithic. We're talking about the old time stellar cults. Set is also a lunar god who gives birth to another lunar god known as Thoth. And Set is very androgynous. That's to say, Set has male and female characteristics. Most famously, there's a myth of, it, of the homosexual episode whereby he swallows his own seed and thereby creates. And that whole episode contains many important secrets that are still used in contemporary magic. And what is called a homosexual episode can also be seen as an androgynous episode. Not only does he produce seed or semen, which is a male motif, when persuaded in the myth to swallow his own semen, he gives birth, which we say is a female motif. The episode itself shows male and female characteristics of the god, therefore set. Like many, many Egyptian deities and many gods and goddesses of other traditions, is actually androgynous. His myth reprises the creative motif of the androgynous creator god Atom or Amun-Ra, the creator of everything. In the myth of Amun-Ra, he creates the whole world by first a process of masturbation, which is a male motif, and then again swallowing his own semen, which he spits forth to create the world, which is a female motif. So Set is the hidden god whose truth can only be revealed through the reversal of the commonplace view. The cult of Set is all about encounters with the demonic. This is the crooked one. Hence any form of demonic initiation is about looking at the negative rather than false positives. Demonic initiation can also be about teaching through random coincidences and through the seemingly odd. This kind of demonic initiation is often referred to as exorcism. And the meaning of the term exorcism has changed slightly in modern use, and its Gnostic component has been downplayed in modern accounts. Exorcism can be likened to the process of deconditioning that is known so well in the later cult of Tantrism. And we also find exorcism at play in a ritual known as Libba Samek. Libba Samek is one of the most famous rites of the modern cult of Thelema. And in fact, if you look at the words of this ritual, you'll find it's in fact an ancient rite of exorcism. And not only is it a rite of exorcism, but behind the scenes we find the god Set. Ancient exorcism almost always involved the god Set. A good example of this is the hippopotamus ivory wand, which is used to mark a magical circle around a newborn baby and thus acts as a shield to control dangerous demonic spirits who would attack during the night when the stars are outside of the body of Nuit. Again, we find the theme of ambiguity and secret meanings in anything that exists and that we know about from the past. Set, who is sometimes said to be a demonic, violent, passionate god, is sure invoked to protect the newborn baby. It's a good example of how the real Set... The real personality of Set lies hidden beneath accumulated layers of meaning. The cult of Set is intimately connected with sexual secrets, which are so very, very relevant in the new eon. We have tried to dispense with much cultural detail and see a universal pattern here, something that speaks directly to the living phenomena which is the magician. We have ventured into the realm of the god Set, we have explored the theme of ambiguity. We have touched on the original demonology. 
i.e. transactions between gods, demons and ourselves, and here as well the role of blood. We have revealed how these transactions are re related to exorcism, but exorcism perhaps not as you know it. We see exorcism as a form of gnosis, hence a form of demonic initiation. Later tantric schools of Asia follow this road of gnosis and deconditioning. And I'm reminded of Alistair Crowley's famous ritual Libba Samek, or as it's sometimes known, the Bornless Ritual. This is part of the same complex. The headless one invoked in this spell could well be one of the ancient names of Set. Subject to me, O demons, so that every demon, whether of the heavens, of the earth, of the air, of the underworld, of the terrestrial or the aquatic, may be obedient to me and every enchantment and scourge which is from God. And all demons will be obedient. <laughs> 